Thank you very much. It's very good to be here. When I was an intern in 1973, I watched a baby die. His name was Sam, or at least that's what we called him, and he didn't have much of a chance from the beginning. He was delivered in the emergency room to a very young woman who arrived late at night in labor. Uh, she was anemic and malnourished. And baby Sam weighed less than three pounds and wasn't breathing when he came into this world. And we had to resuscitate him before we transferred him to my service on the neonatal intensive care unit. And I was part of his short life from the moment he was born until he died two days later. And I remember standing beside him during that final hour, knowing what was going to happen and feeling helpless and depressed. And he was so tiny. His skin was a pale pink, at least that's how it started out, almost translucent, like, like mother of pearl. And he had a mask over his nose and mouth that carried an oxygen and warm mist through this green tube. And his little belly was very distended, and when he breathed, the tissue between his ribs was pulled in with the effort. And one of his little fists was gripping that green tube like he was looking for something stable to hold on to. And his little bright eyes were looking at me as if from a great distance. And they seemed to magnify the desperation of his struggle and reflect it back out into the room. And I knew he was going to die. I knew there was nothing I could do about it. He was just wearing out. He couldn't pull that oxygen in and out of his lungs much longer. But his little eyes held mine, even as his chest heaved up and down. And then gradually the rise and fall got less and less until it was almost imperceptible. And it seemed to me as if his eyes flashed, like he was calling to me, inviting me to come with him, giving me one last chance to join him beyond the struggle. Then he was gone. And it was just the soft hiss of the oxygen and the mist rising up from around his mask. Sam died in the intensive care unit of a, an acute care hospital. He didn't die because he lacked access to the U.S. medical system. And his mother was on Medicaid. He didn't die because he lacked coverage. He died because neither Sam nor his mother had access to the most fundamental social investments that are necessary for healthy pregnancies and safe communities. And I remember what a quiet death it was. There was no one there but his mother and a nurse and myself. No one else knew about Sam's two-day struggle to live. It never made the papers, never made the evening news. It was an anonymous tragedy that just touched the lives of those who were there. And now, 45 years later, that same anonymous tragedy happens over and over and over again in this wealthy nation of ours. And every time it does, we are all diminished and we lose a little bit more of the soul of America. Those of you gathered here today are the most powerful voices in the nation for consumers, for children and families, and for equity and opportunity and for social justice. And it is truly an honor to be here and to have the opportunity to share a few thoughts with you this morning. And I wanna thank you. I wanna thank you for all you do, for your passion, for your persistence, for your commitment to a more just and equitable society, and particularly for your fierce and unrelenting advocacy for universal coverage. But I also want to ask if your advocacy may be incomplete. I want to ask if the moral and fiscal imperative to add value is just as compelling and just as urgent as the imperative for universal coverage. So let's define terms. We all know what coverage is. It's the ability to pay for your own health care without economic hardship, without being crippled by huge co-pays and deductibles. It's not having to choose between rent and prescription drugs. It's not having to worry about surprise bills. Value is something entirely different. Value is the recognition that the purpose of the health care system is not just to finance and deliver medical care, it's to keep people healthy. Value is the recognition that not only do people need coverage, the ability to pay for their health care, but the care they receive and the system through which they receive it should add value. It should produce positive health outcomes. 
that we shouldn't be using public dollars to finance overtreatment or inflated prices or care that's ineffective or inefficient. But most of all, most of all, value is a recognition that those things that by far have the greatest impact on our health have very little to do with our healthcare system and everything to do with the conditions of injustice that underlie disease, poverty, and hunger, and abuse, and neglect, and discrimination. So my message to you this morning is that universal coverage, as important as it is, will not by itself get us the level of social justice or the degree of equity and opportunity that should be the birthright of everyone in this country. And that to truly lift up those who, for whom we advocate, expansions in coverage must go hand in hand with improvements in value. Let me illustrate that with a story, one that moved me deeply, and I've only changed the names to uh, cover the identity of the people who were involved. It's an Oregon story. It's the story of Susan uh, and uh, her daughter, Patty. Susan was born into an abusive family. She was abused sexually and physically by her alcoholic father and eventually fled to the streets of Portland. Where homeless and alone and desperate for love and looking for a place to belong, she continued to be victimized and turned to alcohol and drugs and became pregnant at the age of 17. Alone and with no moral guidance, no support, she continued to use drugs and alcohol during her pregnancy. Now, giving birth to a child, which is truly, and I know personally, one of life's greatest joys and greatest blessings, was for Susan a nightmare. When her daughter Patty was born, she was not only very premature, she had fetal alcohol syndrome. And Susan, Susan returned to the streets of Portland, where she remains today, homeless and addicted and transient. At the young age of 19, any chance she might have had for a nurturing, healthy life a life of contribution and accomplishment and satisfaction has all but evaporated. Her daughter is a ward of the state of Oregon. She was diagnosed with fetal alcohol syndrome, depression, and a whole host of mental health disorders, including attention deficit disorder. Her original adoptive family gave her up because they couldn't manage these issues. She had 26 foster placements, 26 before she was finally admitted to a residential mental health facility where she still lives. I know of no yardstick that can measure the depth of this tragedy. The tragedy of a young woman, addicted, homeless, living on the streets of Portland who will never know her daughter. A young girl who will live out her lives in the walls of an institution. And the tragedy of knowing that we could have presented, prevented this outcome but failed uh, to do so. The point is that none of this had anything to do with access to the U.S. healthcare system. Nor would a policy of universal coverage have materially changed this outcome. In fact, a dramatic expansion of coverage without demanding value would have exacerbated rather than mitigated the circumstances that led to this tragedy. Why? Because among those things that have the greatest impact on people's lifetime health status, medical care is a very small contributor. Far more important are things like healthy pregnancies, nutrition, housing, stable families, safe communities, education, and a good job, the social determinants of health. I deeply believe that universal coverage, or more appropriately, universal access to quality, affordable medical care provided when and where people need it is not only one of the benchmarks of a just society, but is also critical uh, to the health of the nation. At the same time, blindly pumping more money into our current healthcare system without demanding value actually undermines our ability to invest in those things that actually make the greatest contribution to health. Healthy pregnancies, good housing, good jobs, those things that form the very threads of the fabric from which the fabric of social justice is woven. Let me uh, turn to a quote from Robert Kennedy. Healthcare and poverty are inseparable issues and no program to improve the nation's health 
will be effective unless we understand the conditions of injustice which underlie disease. It is illusory to think that we can cure a sickly child and ignore his need for enough food uh, to eat. One of the reasons that we can't break the logjam on health care is because it is focused primarily, at least today, on coverage, not value, and it needs, to be it needs to be focused on both. For example, neither Democrats nor Republicans assume any fundamental change in the underlying health care business model or cost structure. We either pay for it or we don't, which creates the logjam, which creates this false choice, this zero-sum choice between cost and access. Focusing primarily on coverage, as important as that is, does nothing to address the total cost of care or to hold the delivery system accountable for quality and outcomes. And while universal coverage may give us all access to a medical system, it is a medical system which, by even the most conservative estimates, wastes 30% of the money that it spends. And that is simply not value. This is not an either-or choice. This is not a zero-sum situation that we're involved in here. It involves demanding value for each and every dollar we put into the U.S. medical system. It involves demanding that providers in the delivery system assume accountability for quality and outcomes and consumer satisfaction. It means putting downward fiscal pressure on a system that has become obsessed with the delivery of medical care as an economic commodity at the expense of health for the American people. And it means rooting out those multiplying elements of the system that are focused solely on maximizing revenue, increasingly financed with limited public resources. And our limited public resources, our precious public resources, are exactly that. They are public resources. They reflect a fiscal commons. They're shared resources raised from all of us, and they should be spent in a way that benefits all of us, not just some of us. And they are limited. They're finite, which means that public resources spent on one set of services are not available to be spent on another set of services, which means by failing to demand value for what we spend on medical care, we are essentially embracing that 30% waste, a trillion dollars a year that could and should be spent supporting healthy children and families. Those of you gathered here today Hold the moral high ground on coverage, on access to the U.S. healthcare system. I'm calling on you to claim the moral high ground on value. Even as you advocate to add trillions of additional public resources to finance universal coverage, there is a moral and fiscal imperative to demand that we are not simply buying access to the current dysfunctional medical model, but to a model that does not waste 30 cents on the dollar a model that doesn't undermine our ability to invest in housing and healthy families and good jobs and safe neighborhoods, the things that form the scaffolding on which the House of Social Justice is built. Let me return once more to Robert Kennedy, whose untimely death in 1968 was the inspiration for my own career in public service. On April 5th of that fateful year, the day after Martin Luther King was assassinated, Kennedy gave some brief remarks to the City Club of Cleveland, the only appearance he made that day. And it was a speech about the stain of violence in America, <clears throat> about the physical violence that was overtaking our country. And then he said, there is another kind of violence, slower but just as deadly destructive as the shot or the bomb in the night, and that is the violence of institutions, of indifference and inaction and decay. This is the violence that afflicts the poor, that poisons relations between men because their skin is of different colors. This is the slow destruction of a child by hunger and schools without books and homes without heat in the winter. Schools without books, homes without heat in the winter, and hunger and homelessness and families under economic stress, and the disintegration of communities, and unemployment, and most of all, the creeping menace of despair and fading hope for a better future. These are cancers on the body of our community, and they have almost nothing to do with our medical system and everything to do with the cost of that system. And our failure to demand value for the dollars we spend on medical care is directly responsible for our inability to invest in those things that could actually bring relief 
to these struggling Americans, that could lift them up, that could give them hope and give them health and give them an equal opportunity for a better life. I believe that ensuring all of our children have an equal opportunity to succeed is the single most important pressing domestic challenge we face as a nation today. And contrary to what we're being told by our current political leadership, the greatest threat of, to America is not terrorism, it's not immigration, it's not the trade deficit with China. It's the fact that over 60% of our children are exposed at a very, very early age to one or more risk factors that can profoundly compromise their ability to succeed. And we cannot solve that problem by investing more money in our medical system, but only by investing more money in our communities. And we cannot shield our children from these risk factors by building a wall, but only by building strong, resilient, healthy, successful families. The consequences to a child of toxic stress during his or her mother's pregnancy is not as compelling, it's not as visible, it's not as urgent as the consequences of someone who loses access to the acute medical system. <clears throat> but as Robert Kennedy pointed out, it may be slower, but it is just as deadly destructive. Our political system tends to focus and pay for things that are compelling and visible and urgent. We tend to focus on immediate problems rather than investments that could prevent those problems in the first place. For example, if given the choice between funding prenatal care and resuscitating a 500 gram infant in the neonatal intensive care unit, the, 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 the emotional and political imperative always drives the money into the hospital and out of the community. Why? Because to the political system, because to policymakers, and certainly because of the media. That infant is visible and, com and, and compelling. Whereas the tens of thousands of women who lack prenatal care, who are hungry and homeless during their pregnancies are anonymous and therefore they are invisible from the standpoint of public policy. I'm calling on you to assume the responsibility to move the national conversation beyond this false choice by demanding value for what we spend on health care, by giving voice to the voiceless and making visible those who currently are not seen. I'm calling on you to assume the leadership to redefine the terms of the national health care debate and to grow your mission, to grow your mission, certainly continuing your vocal and relentless advocacy for universal coverage, but to temper and to hone that advocacy by, by becoming the most powerful voice in America for value in the allocation of public resources and for the proposition that each and every one of us deserves and in fact has the right to an equal opportunity to be healthy, which doesn't have a whole lot to do with the US medical system. Let me leave you with a story told by Oregon Poet Laureate Kim Stafford. It's a true story and one that I think is, a, is an apt metaphor for what I'm asking you to do today. Lloyd Reynolds, the international citizen of Portland, spent his last days silent, unable to write or to speak, lying in a hospital bed. On his last day at home, as his wife scurried to pack his suitcase for the hospital, Lloyd made his way outside to the garden, and there she found him on his knees, awkwardly planting flower bulbs with a spoon. Lloyd, she said, you'll never see those flowers bloom. He smiled at her. They're not for me, he said. They're for you. The salmon coming home, they're for you. The calls of the wild geese, they're for you. The last old trees, they're for you and your children to the seventh generation and beyond. They're all blooming into being for you. When we structure universal coverage around value, those benefits are for all of us too. For you and for me, for your children, for your grandchildren, for their children, to the seventh generation and beyond. Our responsibility is to plant the seeds of tomorrow, to create that fertile ground in which our families and our children can thrive. <laughs>
So look with me once more into Sam's eyes and promise, promise that we will do better. Thank you. Thank you.